Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 32 of the Cube Pod. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, extracting the signal from the noise. Every week we get together, talk about the news that run down and what we saw that was important and things that might not have been on the radar that we think are important or things that are underreported and just controversy, commentary on enterprise and emerging tech. And Dave, uh, great to see you. We're back another week. Hey, hey. 32 straight weeks and a uh, lot to unpack. We're going to we're going to talk about uh, in a deep dive segments the Dell financial meeting. You have great insight around the cash flow and the brilliance of Michael Dell, but also is, a, is there a financial crisis coming? All the indicators are there. We're going to talk about that big time. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Flexport culture clash and the the, the rapid dismissal of the former Bezos Lieutenant uh, Clark, uh, David Clark, which is uh, all the Amazonians just got killed, basically. Um, and then the whole MGM, we're going to unpack the pay or not to pay. And of course, the startup ecosystem is changing radically. The financings are down, but up. Valuations are changing. We'll get all that data. We're going to share that with you. I got some information there. And of course, the generative AI madness continues with SuperCloud coming this month. And then there's a big debate, open or closed with OpenAI. We're going to unpack all that. Of course, the rant section we're going to talk about. Probably the DOJ and Lena Khan, probably most likely. Um, I have some of those there, but <laughs> we're going to we're going to unpack a lot today. So you know, if you're listening, you know, stay tuned. And we got a couple surprises in the middle of the podcast for you. Um, first, the news, Dave, for MGM. Um, we've been talking to the past two pods around the hack. We were in the ARIA for the SAS event when it went down. Uh, it turns out we got everything right in our story. We were right about the hack, how it was done, and the damage, and the facts that it didn't pay. What's coming out now in the Wall Street Journal and a variety of other outlets are reporting is that the damage is at least $100 million to MGM. They'll take that hit in their third quarter earnings. And, you know, they they held their ground. They managed through the disruption. They would not give in. And we're going to talk about this in the pay or unpay section. Meaning they didn't pay they didn't pay the uh, the ransom. Right? They didn't pay the ransom. So hold back on this. We're going to move to the news for us. But we're going to we're going to unpack this. This is a modern phenomenon. What do you pay the ransom hostages? Do you negotiate with terrorists? This is a classic kind of prisoner's dilemma theory, Dave. And so we're going to unpack that as well as other game theory around what do you do with, with ransomware? Okay. It's ransom. It's software. It's a new kind of concept. There's now strategies. I guarantee you books are going to be written on this. So we're going to unpack it big time. Um, other news, Anthropic is playing the field. That's the hot AI company, kind of second fiddle to gen open AI in terms of hype. Open AI was first. Anthropic ran right up to the top. Our friend Jack Clark, former journalist at the Register, worked there. I just got a text from here. He wants to chat. That's great news. Love this company because they're the ex open AI guys who started Anthropic, rode the wave, will probably be one of the big, large language models that are going to survive. Open AI, Anthropic, AI21 Labs, these are the these are going to be the winners. And and as you put out, Dave, and, and, and the Silicon Angle team, the power law is in play. People are validating that. So uh, we'll come back to that. But Anthropic just did a massive deal, got married with AWS, big $4 billion investment option, million and a half guaranteed. Big deal with Bedrock, big deal with AWS, buying some GPUs and probably some chip action with AWS now playing the field, getting Google to throw a big investment in. So, I mean, talk about, you know, getting, leaving, leaving the altar, straying off the reservation, Dave. Wandering eye. What do you call it? <laughs> anyway, we're this is serious stuff. Uh, and then Elon Musk is being sued by the SEC. Apparently, he didn't show up for a subpoena to go over his uh, in his testimony for his Twitter acquisition. He's he's going ballistic, saying we should ban all three letter agencies, and the tw and the Twitter mob is going crazy. And of course, the a the UK antitrust hawks are zeroing in on cloud providers in the UK. AWS and Microsoft Azure are being targeted for not letting competition compete and holding down competition, which is bullshit. Uh, Intel spinning out their uh, one of their big pieces. That's their their programmable chip business. Um, and they're going to, uh, with an IPO slated for two, three years. So, you know, you can see Pat Gelsinger shedding some of the, the, the wars that he's capping on multiple fronts, as you say. And then TSMC says at their Arizona fab will not be profitable as their Taiwan fabs, implying the U.S. is lagging behind in talent, cost structures, experience, duh. You think so? Uh, and then Jeremy Burton, our friend, uh, CEO and founder of Observe, raised a Series A round of $50 million that integrates generative AI to simplify application observability. Notable friend of the Cube. Um, he's been with us since the beginning. Nice uh, raise. 
He, Congratulations. CMO of EMC, became a big executive president, and then went to Dell, CMO there, started a company. He's on the board of Snowflake, Dave. So, you know, squinting through that, that's just not some yes, some startup. That's Jeremy Burton. That's Snowflake board member. That's a senior executive. He knows something we don't. So that's something to put out there. And of course, the Flexport drama amid more layoffs. This is going to be a story I'm going to unpack in the section there. A lot of inside baseball going on here. Founder came out of retirement, fired the team that he brought in to scale it. Apparently, there was a culture clash, and there was a big expose on CNBC, uh, the inside story of Dave Clark's tumultuous last days at Flexport, apparently bored coup, complete assassination, and then ousting by the founder. Founder came back in, didn't like what he saw. And then Amazon's losing people to MongoDB. They got the new CTO at MongoDB, Jim Scharf, who's joining them. So a lot of Amazonians are the early DNA of AWS, Dave, are landing in this kind of like an AWS mafia going on. And we're gonna we're gonna do we're gonna talk a lot about this on the pod going forward, especially leading up to reinvent and after. You're seeing the shift of talent there during the Jassy days, moving out of the company with their experience under their belt, 10 plus years more, going in and leading other companies. This is a, a the mafia move, PayPal mafia, the VM mafia. The Google Mafia. Now you got the Amazon Web Services, my pe people who leave the companies in groups and bring that culture to other companies. So whenever that happens, good things happen. So these so-called little migrations have always yielded amazing change. Again, PayPal, called the PayPal Mafia, Elon Musk, all the guys there involved in there, Reed Hoffman, Max Ledgkin, all those guys started some great companies. Obviously, Google, ex Googlers. Um, and then uh, now AWS and, of course, VMware. We, we all know Jerry Chen, Pete Sonsini, Steve Herod, and the list goes Carl Eschenbach. The list goes on and on. So I think that's going to be a very interesting trend, Dave, in the modern era is to see those cloud legends uh, in companies. And then finally, the final note here in the, my news feed today is uh, IronNet, a company that I liked because Keith Alexander was the founder, went belly up after two years going public in the SPAC. Maybe they shouldn't have done the SPAC deal. So um, C5 Capital, uh, he, uh, Andre Pinar put money into that. Alex, uh, Keith Alexander, great guy, great person. So it's sad to see a, to a security him. legend go under like that. So that's pretty much top level news, Dave. And you know, I mean, to me, what jumps out at me is the whole the whole um, generative AI, uh, anthropic playing the field, and the whole crypt uh, security data coming out. You know, first of security data, 100 million at least in damage. They held the line. And well, they're paying for it, but they, you know, had, they had all their stuff back. The thing about that is, you know, you're, at, you're, right, you're asking the right question. Should you pay the ransom or not? Do you pay terrorists? Um, Caesar's paid, right? Caesar's paid like 10 million and got back yeah. online. I, 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 now, you know, the FBI will tell you definitely do not pay. Uh, when I ask this question of executives, whether it's uh, Palo Alto or CrowdStrike or Zscaler, they say, well, the best bet is to, you know, they're self-serving. The best bet is not to, not to mm -hmm. get into a position where you got to pay the ransom, but uh, <laughs> that doesn't what help do somebody think? who's got to pay, pay the or, ransom. Pay or not to pay? What do you do with the ransom? This, I think this it is, depends. This is a new cultural thing. So there's a couple of things. One is if it's a, if it's a nation state attack and that nation state is North Korea or Iran, first of all, you, 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 it's illegal. To, to pay those companies, uh, those countries, you know, you can't send money to, to those rogue states. So that's a, that's a, le there's legal exposure there that you have to evaluate. I think the second thing you have to evaluate is, okay, what is it going to take to get us back online? You're saying MGM shelled out a hundred, a hundred million. No, that was the damages in total. They didn't, MGM didn't shell anything. No, 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 Caesars. sorry. The, the, the cost, what I, what I, I should have restated. The cost to them was a hundred million. And that's, I would say at least. I mean, the damage is 100 million, but gosh, the lost productivity, I, I don't know if they're calculating the lost business in there, reputation. I mean, it could be a lot higher than that. I don't know what the market cap yeah. impact was. I don't follow those stocks. But so I think you have to factor all those things in. And frankly, I think in some cases you should pay, but <laughs> but you may not. You still may not get your data back. I mean, I've talked to customers who'd have paid and didn't get their data back, or they only got yeah. partial partial data back, and they had to go back and continue to negotiate. So, 
I actually do think the advice of the the self-serving tech vendors is the right advice is put yourself in a position so you, that you don't get get hacked and make those investments. And so, and you know, that sounds good, but the whole game has changed. The game is all about speed. How fast can you get in and get out? And so you got to accelerate and you got to accelerate yeah. the time it, it takes for you to identify and protect and recover or fence. It's all about exfiltration now. It's not about dwell yeah. time anymore. It's not about saying, hey, they were in there for 172 days. Let's get that down to 90 or 30 or 50 and make it harder for them. No, forget that. That shouldn't be the focus. The focus should be on, you know, CrowdStrike says stop the breach. That's their sort of tagline. Yeah. I think that's the right mindset. It's hard to do. But the more emphasis you put on stopping the breach and that mindset, the harder it is for the, the 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 hackers to get in and it'll force them to go somewhere else. The thing about the um, this time is, is that I think the government has to get involved. And that came out of the Mandiant conference when I was there. One thing I was trying to figure out is what does the public-private partnership look like relative to these catastrophic events? I mean, think about it. MGM, you know, they're supposed to have top-notch security, as does all the casinos, because that's where the money is. <laughs> you got, that's with banks and casinos. That's where the money is, right? So um, you got to think about the fact that, you know, the government is, has to get involved and assist, not just an audit, but like wow. help the military. I mean, you're talking about Cyber Command is built to be our our, our cyber um, defense, our cyber military. And so, you know, I really look at the government's responsibility like the mil physical military to have a digital response. And um, there's more, we got to pay more attention to the actors involved. And and we know the game. If it's China or Russia or North Korea, they can't do state on state. So what they do is they kind of create this kind of like, like fake company or shell company version of a of, of, of attack, or they enable some group with open source tooling to another group um to take credit for it when it's really initiated by them so you know i think we have to kind of read between the lines and saying okay we can trace this back to north korea and we counter strike well so then and, you gotta and, be careful and, you gotta be careful about that but first of all why you know, not the, why not counter strike well, uh, if, if it's the okay so there, let me, counter let me, strike let me comment then okay so first of all the, i mean i'm you know the government obviously the people inside the u.s government that we have they have excellent you know cyber capabilities to your point they could counter strike mm -hmm. There is some finger wagging going on, you know, the, the executive order of you better get your shit together. You know, these unfunded mandates, it's like, okay, that's not very helpful. I don't think it's very helpful that, you know, the, the posture of the, the DOJ and the FTC and the FTC is let's start with break up Amazon. That's their starting point as opposed yeah. to, Hey, let's have a public private partnership. But to answer your question, again, this goes back to my conversation with Robert Gates. I said the same thing. It's like, why don't we just attack them? Take them out. He goes, we got to be careful. You, you, you attack these countries. Okay, fine. But we have more to lose than they do. So they start attacking our critical infrastructure, you know, versus, you know, you know what are you going to do to Afghanistan? You know, you knock out Afghanistan's infrastructure, big deal. You know, but if if Iran is attacking our critical infrastructure, you know, our our waterways, our, 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 our the electricity grid, the power grid, et cetera, you know, we saw what happened with, with, with pipelines, food supplies, we have a lot to lose because we got the biggest economy in the world. And so he was saying, you have to take a measured response and do so, you know, very carefully and very thoughtfully. So, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there are responses. And I think, by the way, he didn't say this, but I think what he meant is that you got to show them that you could kick their ass, like go in and just point the gun right at their critical infrastructure and say, stop, you know, cut the shit or we're going to, we're going to take this out, you know, that threat. And and you play that game, you expose that. Well, the current you military, pull the, trigger, the current trigger. military doctrine is to say, if you can't ask, we hit you harder back. Um, obviously, um, ransomware is cyber warfare. Okay. It's being done maliciously for money. Um, and so if the private companies are, have to defend themselves, then what is the government's role? I mean, if if they dropped physical troops on our soil in the United States in Vegas and went into MGM and, you know, held everyone hostage and took the cash and ran away, you think that and they knew who they were, what would we do? Yeah, it, would right. a, it would be a it's disaster. True. It would it's be a good OK. Point. It's like, all right, they're physically here. 
but they're also digitally here. So I, I think the conversations I heard in in, uh, in DC when I was there, and I've had many more of them since the Jedi contract when I started covering that many years ago, is there's a, an awakening in DC in the smart military minds, the generals, not so much on the on the hill. The lawmakers, I think, are still kind of wet wet in 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 this in this area. They're not really getting it, but I think there's a lot of smart you know, policy and military people who actually get it and are trying to make change. And so I'm looking forward to seeing what that is. Again, the pay or not the pay is is, is game, game theory, military tactics, and also like just common sense. It's a first generation technical problem. Like it's okay. You know, it's ransom. <laughs> okay. It's like, and, and it's happening everywhere. So it's not like it's like a one-off thing. I mean, if, if the ransomware crime wave syndicates could have their way, they'd get everybody. So, you know, this puts companies like Dell in great position to make money, certainly commercially. But, um, you know, as we're doing that, we're doing a big series on Silicon Angle and the Cube on, you know, road to cyber resilience, which is all about protecting your, your data. And so, you know, companies yeah. are taking their own measures. And I, I do think that that the U.S. government has to be and I think is rightly cautious about escalation because escalation could happen so fast. And as I say, we, we got a lot to lose. But at the same, I mean, my hey, my instinct is like yours: take them out. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, but, we know but who the they are. But the unintended, we do know who they are. But the unintended concept, and I'm sure there's a lot of like black hat stuff going on and sort of clandestine things that, you know, the guys that you talk to at Mandiant and I talk to at CrowdStrike and Palo Alto Networks, all those insiders, they know what's going on. They know, you know, you talk to Kevin Mandia, he know they know exactly where these 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 hacks are coming from these 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 threat actors are they know the signatures yeah. and they know the governments are involved they know their proxies for the government they know it's it's putin and the mullahs and you know the north korean you know chairman whatever you know whatever they call him crazy man yeah. they it's know like that they're behind it and so you know that but still escalation is something that they want to avoid and so we're going to get to the uh, super cloud generative AI industry discussion. I want to just highlight that our power law research we put out from the Cube research team, pretty much on the money. I talked to a bunch of people this week. We'll get into that later. But I wanted to ask you, Dave, about the Dell financial. I mean, you drove down. Yep. You were one of the only analysts, I think, and industry analysts that were invited. I think to I was the only one there. I oh, think. And, well, there was the financial analyst meeting, and you were the only. Yeah, yeah. No, analyst. I was the only industry analyst there. There were. I tell you, it was really well attended. There were. So, probably... give, give us the give us the lowdown. You did a killer tweet. So. If uh, uh by the way, if you're, if you're listening to this, go to Twitter D Volante, D V E L L A N T E. That's the last name D Dave Volante. D Volante. He's got a great update thread on this, and the last one got my attention. Well, that's going to be the next segment around the financial crisis coming. But what did you see? I mean, you made a comment about Michael Dell just leveraging the uh, zero interest rate, free money era, uh, and to how he maximized that for just. Brilliant move. Take us through absolutely, the first. Take us first. Take us through the Dell meeting, and then let's comment about Michael Dell. A absolutely incredible. I mean, it was you know in in New York City where these things take place. There were there were close to a hundred people there. I mean, and, and probably 70, 80 an, uh, uh, financial analysts. As I say, I was the only industry analyst there. I mean, I loved it. I had the whole reign to myself. It was awesome. Michael was there. Michael Dell. You know Jeff Clark, all the the whole the entire IR team, Yvonne McGill, the new CFO, uh, Jeff Boudreau, and I were hanging out uh, for a while talking. He's the new AI czar at at Dell. Uh, uh, Vivek, the the new head of strategy, and I spent a lot of time together. Arthur Lewis was there. He runs ISG now. Sam Bird is the president of the client division, and basically, you know, the message to the analysts was really simple. You buy our stock, we're going to send 80% of our adjusted free cash flow back to investors. So basically, buy our stock, we're going to give you money. And, and the reason that Dell's in a position to do that is because they they buy EMC for whatever, $63 billion. Yeah. They use the cash flow from VMware in combination with the tracking stock to basically continue to delever they sold assets they continue to use that cash flow to pay down the debt they used vm with that tracking stock mechanism to go public again from private so oh. <laughs> and then they did a special dividend to basically completely restructure dell's balance sheet they spun out vmware and dell's now got an awesome balance sheet they've got 
They've got excess cash of around, they only need four to $5 billion to run the business. So they've got excess cash, you know, sloshing around of like 5 billion that they keep around as cushion. So they could use that for tuck in M and a, or, you know, just for a rainy day. So they basically said to wall street, look, we're going to give the money back to our investors. Now, Michael Dell owns a very large portion of the company. I don't know if it's, if it's a controlling interest. Does he own more than 50%? I have to do some research. Of what, the on new, that. of the VMware? No, of, um, no, he doesn't own 40% of, or 50% of VMware, but he might own, does he own over half a Dell? He might. I got to do research on that. I, I, I don't know. I don't know the uh, answer. And so, but I do know this a very large portion of those dividends go right back directly to Michael Dell. And, and, and cause you know, he's the, he's a big owner. He's owns a lot of stock. And when they, when they buy back stock, it reduces the number of outstanding shares. And so the value of Dell goes up and he benefits from that. Wall street was concerned. The analysts were concerned about a liquidity issue. Like, will there be enough liquidity? If you keep pumping your money back in and giving you know, dividends and doing buybacks, aggressive buybacks and reduce the share count, will there be enough liquidity for investors? And will there be a market? And they, uh, Yvonne McGill, the CFO, and Michael said, yeah, we're fine. There's plenty of shares out there. Michael also said, basically, I'm going to do philanthropy with that money. So, you know, so so watch for that. And uh, so, it was, <laughs> it, 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 so you know, this guy gives billionaires a good name, Michael Dell. He's a gentleman. I tweeted today that he reminds me of my old boss, Pat McGovern, who is a true gentleman, you know, yeah. uh, 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 rest in peace. Thanks, Pat. But so- uh, the other the other takeaways that were interesting is they gave guidance on growth two to three percent for the client business, so the, you know, pretty pretty tepid growth for the PCs, but six to eight percent for ISG, that's server and storage, which I thought was optimistic. And when 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 the analysts pushed on that, uh, Arthur Lewis, who runs ISG, basically said, "Look, we're going to have higher." ACVs through because of, you know AI is going to require bigger configurations and that's going to start to hit next year. So he's signing up for eight percent growth, uh, and 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 most of that's going to come from servers, storage, you know, a little bit less uh, of a factor, but that's a higher margin business for Dell. So the margin model should improve. Uh, now here's the big question: What's the baseline? of that growth from they won't say <laughs> so it's not a hundred billion which they so they were like a hundred billion last year and then they'll do like 90 billion this year 93 i think is the number so is it, so, is that, so they're they're so, the, are you saying so, they're going so, for acquisition i mean dividends or wait, wait 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 so they're opaque about what the baseline is for that growth they won't actually tell you they say it's mid-cycle so they'll assume it's 90 growing from 95 billion but so so, so they don't really know. So what they're going to, it's a game that they're playing. Basically, if, if they only grow whatever, you know, 2% instead of 3% or whatever, they can say, oh, well, we're going from this baseline. So they can set the baseline wherever they want. They can move, move the bar. And that's what, that's what I think the stock dropped actually yesterday after the analyst meeting. And I think that was maybe the reason why I'm not sure, but it's, it's up, it was up again earlier today, but, but, but to your question, they got a lot of extra cash and they're throwing off cash like crazy. Thanks mm -hmm. to this restructuring. And then the last thing I'll say, so Michael on the TV today said, you know, they were pushing him around, you know, higher interest rates. And he's like, yeah, well, it's probably the way it should be. And it's fine. And I'm like, yeah, I tweeted out. I was like, it's fine because he's well through the knot hole. He bought, he bought EMC when interest rates were near zero. They were given cash away. I mean, his timing is impeccable. His timing and execution yeah. are yeah. absolutely remarkable. I think that's I think that's the key point. And then he just really maximized the corp dev machine. And VMware is interesting too. That was a big piece of it. And they're getting that down to the wire, Dave. This we're in this October. month, right? This, this is month. the month where Broadcom takes over. So on November 1st, Broadcom will officially own VMware as the end of a chapter. So I've had so many phone calls this week from VMware folks. Uh, the CMO I had a half hour call with on some um, strategies we're talking about there and on some of the initiatives they have, but you know, people are just reaching out, they're, they're networking and, and uh, people are preparing. I mean, they're, this is where the um, non, everyone below the VP layer gets notified. And the word is, it's going to be a much flatter organization than what people thought. Of course, we've been saying it all along. I, I think ultimately it's going to be our original prediction Um it's going to be right as we had been tracking Broadcom 
track record as well as their company for many, many years. As you know, we've been on top of this, and we, and it's very clear what they're going to do. And Hawk Tan has never wavered. He he's been clear from day one. Everyone's been in denial. <laughs> we was like, guys, he's, you know, is there, there's no need to zig and zag. It's coming. So uh, you know, I, I they gave it a good run. Let's see if they can keep cross cloud services going. <laughs> um, you know, execute or be executed. Yeah, rum- <laughs> rumors are already they're folding. You know these divisions in, into the cloud under the cloud, modern apps, cloud management gone. Um, you know folding in under cloud because I, I think you know if you look at Hawk Tan's strategy. He's all about selling more stuff, and we were the first ones to break that. By the way, that 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 report turns out based on internal validation. I've talked to people. Um, that's a, now fact. That's 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 been validated and verified. Get clients buying more, and you know you want to simplify it. And I think his strategy, Dave, the way I'm reading this is with VMware. When Broadcom buys VMware, he wants to go to the market and saying, "Here's everything," and just get a license, and then. Let them use everything and get as much installed as possible, then start charging, right? So um, this idea that, you know, this group sells that, that group sells that, I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's going to be one go-to-market motion. Here's your VMware, go. And you can have everything. We'll see. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to pan out on a P&L basis, but, you know, that's what this integration looks like it's going to do. Well, if they're going to charge for it. That'll be great for the PL. If they if it's if it's you know shelfware, yeah. I mean problem. Like, so, like V Realize and all these other services, they said throw it in, have it. Don't even charge for it. Part of the deal. Oh, come on. Yeah, but they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna charge yeah. for it. <laughs> Get them gonna... First hits free. You know, that's what they, you know, the drug dealer business is very key. First hits free. <laughs> you know? That's... You think they're going to give this stuff away? I, th- I, think, I think they're going to. I think I think, sell I think I think they're going to give a chance to see what they go to market. But the best move is to start bundling and then unbundling later. Because if you look at VMware, what are they really buying? What it's vSphere, okay, and some other core products. Outside of that, everything else has got to be sold separately. Now you you don't need those separate P and Ls. You just throw it under one and have people just turn on everything. They're buying five hundred thousand customers that are locked in. That's yes. what they're buying. Yeah. And I so, mean, it's, 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 it's yeah. for, right? I mean, business school 101. I learned this in my first year of my MBA. You want to have nestedness, you want to have your tentacles in there. So if you're, if you got that operating leverage with vSphere and their, their core product, get more, uh, get more tentacles in there so you can't be replaced. The, the rip, the rip out switching cost is too high, right? We know that. We've, you, you and I have ripped on this all the time. You point, you point this out, I think, more than anyone in the industry. VMware has got customers that are love their one thing, and it's yeah. hard to sw- it's hard to switch. Now you make it harder by getting more stuff embedded, and then you increase the prices, and the switching costs become astronomical. Yeah, but it's that's, still that, it's, that's like, the it's like it's like and lock in. When we talk about lock in, it's such a pejorative term, but you can think about it. Like we have a a building here, we're up for lease. You know, they give us a new lease, they raise the prices. Yeah, it's like, okay, they're raising prices in a situation where commercial real estate, you know, is soft. So you, what do you do? You go around and you look at, you know, what else is out there. And you, when, by the time you, you pack up and move and you deal with all the disruption, it's like, you know what? They got you over the barrel. It's, 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 it's worth paying to stay because the yeah. pain of moving is too great. So the business case isn't there to move. And that's the, the needle that, that Hoctan has to thread. And frankly, I don't think it's that hard. I think as long as they don't get egregious and as long as they keep investing, because, you know, look, let's face it, people don't understand. Broadcom's an engineering company. They don't do any marketing, really. Yeah. Uh, it's right? good to have They're a great brand. Company. I mean, VMware so, brand, they, VMware brand is going to be the uh, great brand for them. It's really good and, win. And, and VMware's got good engineers. And so they'll, they'll spend, they'll yeah. identify a roadmap and they'll continue, yeah. if they can keep them and they'll continue to invest. Yeah. But They'll keep them. I mean, they're gen- they'll keep them. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm be- hey. these guys are gen- Broadcom pays well. That's gotta, one thing. They're going to cut the. They're going to cut the um, all the marketing sales. S- they'll keep the SDs and engineers. Dave. So I brought up I brought up VMware mainly because of the, the, the Dell conversation. Michael Dell uh, made a great load of money in the era era of free money or zero interest rate. Was it was zip zero interest rate Zorba? So are you reading? Now, no, sure. that was the, that's the that's the acronym. I've been, I've been all over the place. Z, yeah, okay. Zero zero interest rates, zero. Um, so now that interest rates are up, 
um, there's a p- tweet out there from Genevieve Roach Decker, who's a Cube alumni. I remember her from the crypto days. She's got quite the following. She's awesome. Um, she writes, good morning, everyone. I can't believe I'm saying this, but the slump in the 10-year, 30-year bonds is approaching the epic drops we saw in stocks during the 2008 financial crisis and the dot-com bubble burst. 10-year bonds are down 46% versus 49% for dot-com stocks. 30-year bonds are down 53% versus the 57% in the 2008 stocks. Basically, cataclysmic numbers relative to, quote, a crash. You know, I've been thinking about this, day. We've been talking about startups falling out of the sky. We might be coming up onto something pretty weird with the market. And what are you, I mean, what's your read on this? I mean, because... You know, I'm in a bubble here in Silicon Valley because this has been the summer of AI love and it's been the most eu- euphoric time since I can remember, since like the Web 2.0 days and the early days of the dot-com. Um, it's super exciting. People are pumped and excited. Now, um, is there a financial storm coming? That's the so, question. So uh, I'm looking at the, uh, uh, read the paper. You know, I love my dead trees. On Wednesday, there's a headline, Soaring Bond Yields Threaten Fed Goal of a Soft Landing. It's like, no shit. Where you guys been? So my <laughs> breaking analysis this week is uh, the title of, you know, higher for longer. It's mine is lower for longer. Tech yeah. spending remains tepid. And so what what I did is I, I we used the ETR data to run a correlation between the interest rate hikes from the Fed and the IT spending outlook. And you can just see the sentiment drop. Prior to the interest rates, Fed tightening, IT spending expectations from CIOs was to grow 7.5%. This goes back to the end of 2021. And then when Ukraine hit and then the Fed started tightening in March, it dropped to you know low sixes. And then it, we exited the year at 4.6. And then in 2023, the outlook drops to 4.1. And now it's down, it started the year at 4.1. Now it's down to 2.9. They hope it's going to be 3.8 next year. I think the likelihood that that drops is greater than than it, than that it goes up, and so this kind of gets into my rant, John. If you if you if you will let me, a little yeah. early, but long term yeah. interest rates. So I'm not really a bond guy, but my bond friends texted me this week and said the bond vigilantes are out, and I'm like, what does that mean? Bond vigilantes. What is what does that mean? What are the bond vigilantes? They said when bond traders when they don't like what the fed is doing and they don't like the 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 policies the fiscal policies of the government they'll sell long they'll sell their bonds because remember the fed controls short term interest rates but the market controls long term interest rates so they'll sell their bonds and that that because they want a better yield and that you know tanks the the prices and so the the demand is going down for these long term bonds the the point is it is that we this debt problem is finally coming home to roost. If if it can't last forever, it won't. I don't know who said that, but I'll just give you some stats. The U.S. debt is now, this is a very cursory analysis. U.S. debt is now $33.5 trillion. U.S. federal tax revenues are $4.3 trillion, but U.S. federal spending is $6.3 trillion. So simple math. The federal government is spending $2 trillion more annually than they take in. And the only way you can cut the $33.5 billion dollar debt is to lower the annual budget deficit. So let's look at that. Four items, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, defense, and interest on the debt make up for 1.6 trillion, 1.3 trillion, 0.8 trillion, and 0.7 trillion. Add that up, four items account for 4.4 trillion or 102% of the annual revenue. And, you know, guys like Ray Dalio say this is going to lead to civil war. We've seen this before. And it's like, no kidding that this is a problem. Mm-hmm. People have been talking about this forever. I hear, you know, guys like Chamat say, yeah, it's not a problem. They'll just restructure it to do 100 year bonds. OK, it, 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 maybe if interest rates come down, that might work, but they're not going anywhere. I mean, they might come down a little bit, but. Yeah, this is bad, and, and I think it could get worse before it gets better. I'll, last thing I'll say is tech companies, senior man, CEOs and CFOs of tech companies have done a good job adjusting and lowering their forecasts. But if earnings have to come down again, there's going to be pain. 
That's mm. it's interesting. I mean, I think it's going to be interesting to see how this all gets washed washed out with the whole digital culture we got now and the GameStop generation coming online. It's going to be very interesting to see, and it's good to get this data out there. By the way, Genevieve's post that that tweet got 1.7 million views. So um, here's the thing, John. Is and this is a question for you. <clears throat> now the wild card here is AI. If yeah. if productivity can grow re revenue right? Because we're now making more money. Companies are making more money. People are making more money. Productivity is better. And it's throwing off more cash to the U.S. government. Maybe maybe they can grow their way out of it. Maybe. Um, but, you know, that's... The, how do you deal with inflation? Um, yeah, the, the AI tricky, thing, the, the, this is... A, uh, I mean, we pointed out on one of our early pods and one of the single-digit pods, This you, you, you and I riffed that this is the first time the Hyperscale cloud players have been involved in a major pivot point in the industry, uh, financial economy, meaning recession or or expansion. Certainly, Amazon was a big driver in the growth of um, past 10, 15 years with the cloud. Cloud technology allowed so much more productivity, digital transformation. Now, it's a double-edged sword. They got to now charge the bills everyone owes them, and they also can be a propellant for people to get out of the the, the, the bad spots they're in business-wise by being agile and more event inventive and faster time to value. So that's the that's the upside scenario there. Downside scenario is, is that they're impacted as well. Now, the AI piece is interesting because all the covers we've been doing, and I've done at least 100 interviews already on this one topic with AI startups and, and companies and experts, there's a there's two things coming out of the AI revolution right now that's that's interesting to me that we're watching that I think could be a 20 to 50 year um, opportunity to change things for the better. One is this new AI system is emerging system, meaning operating system, software system, people system, a configuration of how AI is going to change how people do everything. And that's going to impact also the tech stack from physical to the application layer. So think of it like AI neural networks combined with compute and all kinds of magic and software rolled in data into one, something that's never been done before, a whole new net, new generational shift, like how OSs and mini computers and OSs and PCs came out. Uh, and the other one is the surge of this creative culture. So, I mean, there's always been like this creative class concept, but it's never been like tech creative culture. And so what I mean by that is that there's an, there's an emerging tech creative class emerging and if ai continues to go down this path of of automating and doing tasks that are mundane or undifferentiated heavy lifting as andy jassy calls it or doing tasks that are predictive then it's key and again today's ai is very clear and people this is what all people are talking about there's three things that are happening today that are going to set the table for tomorrow one you got some sort of chat bot you know assistant number two you got this concept of a co-pilot to augment you. And then three, you got this new other benefit like predictive, generative uh, ideation. So some sort of augmentation that's net new. That's what that's that's all that's out there today. I mean, all the all the hubbub and you know, this, that, and the other thing. There's only three things that are going on. Some sort of chat bot, some sort of co-pilot assistant, whether it's coding or whatever, and then predictive and some sort of net new thing. That's going to change everything beyond that because there's going to be even more stuff happening. So the, the, the if you take away the mundane labor tasks in in knowledge work then the what's left is free time so do you think the whole world's going to hit the beach no they're going to do stuff you know they're going to create shit they're going to like invent stuff hopefully world peace you know more balanced economy um more harmony uh more goodness i mean so i think i think you know this ai system concept that's going to be a net new thing that's going to emerge out of the convergence of neural networks, compute, data, apps, something completely diff generationally different. And then two, this creative culture class from technology. Not creative as an art, like that's the old school, but like something new. That to me is what's coming out of the AI. The rest is all just like all in the weeds. People are toiling away, playing with AI because it's super fun because it's, it's, you can see results. Okay, and so these experiments are going very, very well with AI. And then the the, the more pragmatic question everyone's are pointing, or the more pragmatic point everyone's illustrating is, where's the production applications? They're not there yet. So we're in this era of experimentation, great demos, great use case applications. But how do you scale it? 
is there enough power to do it? What's the role of compute and data? And so, you know, again, everything's math. So uh, uh, math, number needs, things math, math needs computers. <laughs> you, you, yeah. And, you know, we like to go back in, in history when 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 the, the the PC wave, you know, knocked out the mainframe and mini computer wave, the new stuff wasn't big enough to offset the, the, the rise in the new wasn't big enough to offset the decline in the old. And there was the tech spending was soft for a period of time as that transition took place. You didn't see that as much. Well, for, then Internet was shot up and it was a bubble and then the whole thing you know burst and so there was a similar dynamic but it was it was the amplitude was greater because of the 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 bubble and the cloud you know we were coming out of the financial crisis and so you had a slow steady rise in in cloud and it was almost like the cloud's ascendancy coincided with a very slow steady comeback of of tech and so on the economy in general so that was kind of a, a different anomaly so here now you have a situation to your point first of all everybody's doing it like 75 80 percent of the companies that are that are that we survey are saying we're experimenting with ai and the other 20 percent, i'm sure are they just the respondent doesn't know much about it and so that's happening and that happens that, that's happened faster than anything i've ever seen before you know normally you think about cloud how many years did it take to get to 75 percent experimentation with cloud i mean it took a long time now everybody's experimenting. The the big question, John, is where's the business value? And unless enterprises can show bottom line business value through cost savings, headcount reductions, or greater productivity, you know, those experimental projects they're going to get their the, the plug pulled, and they're going to they're going to revert back. What's happening now is the AI projects are stealing yeah. from other projects. It's not like CEOs are saying, CFOs, here's more money to go do AI. That's not happening. The data suggests that it's stealing from other areas. So unless they can show a gain share, hey, we're making money now with AI, whether it's cost savings, headcount reductions, better productivity, or even new revenue, which I think is harder to find, then unless that happens, something's got to give. And so- the yeah, question yeah. is, how long is it going to take for that to take shape and the real enterprise apps to hit? That's the, well, that's the that's the billion dollar question. I think you're right. This is where the conversation. But 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 there's the other side of the coin. That first of all, I agree with what you said, and I think that's why I brought up the production workload question. And I had a long chat with the uh, Anthropic, not Anthropic, the AI Twenty One Labs um, co-founder. Um, Ori Goshen, um, just the other day, he's going to be on our SuperCloud event, one of the headlines. Um, and he's one of the, the darling LLMs. It's He said exactly that. I mean, there's so much creativity. People are building stuff that's working right now, but it's not requiring the horsepower that at, you'd need it at scale, or uh, as they say in the enterprise, production apps, which means that it's fully deployed. When you have stuff fully deployed with AI, it's also a system. It's not like a, a server with an application on it, the old days. For the folks that are young, that's how things are. You load an application on a machine and you run it. And you, when it needs more horsepower, you add another machine. Well, uh, you know, guess what? When you got AI, a lot, a lot's integrated. There's like a neural network involved, a lot more data. These large LLMs take, cost billions of dollars to build. They'll be always proprietary and always add value. And so there's a lot of action happening, and 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 the enterprises have to figure it out because there's a lot of things below the application layer that can be app applied all the infrastructure stuff it's still still not even what the first thing it's pre-game on that all the conversation though dave's on the consumer side and there's no doubt people are buying into the productivity people see the ai stuff that's out there now the large foundational models are essentially knowledge worker productivity tools like i said you got a chat bot on your machine answering all the dumb questions that people ask over and over again there's a human there's no human in that loop you don't need one on a chat bot come to my site my app got a chat bot Copilot, this concept of having a computer help me write stories, help me write code, help me brainstorm for my wedding or my party or whatever you're doing, that's adding value. This is clear. And then this predictive side's emerging. That's where it's going to get interesting. And now assume that goes that next level, and it will because it's legit. The question is, what do you run it on and how much does it cost? That is a complete blind spot. And I think everybody uh, is kind of publicly saying it, but not saying it out loud too much because it's like the elephant in the room. This shit's going to cost a lot. And that's why I think you're seeing deals like in, in, uh, Cohere and Anthropic 
and doing monster deals with the big clouds because they're probably getting discount off their bill, right? So because they got they need compute, they need chips. So we're in a game of formation. This is a Cambrian explosion. It's a renaissance, whatever you want to call it. AI is happening. It's completely legit. Um, and it's going to change everything. But it's it's right now we're in the formation stage. And you know what, it's, you know what it, I was, I just as an aside, you know, I was talking at the Dell financial analyst meeting. You know, those guys, I, I'm not a semiconductor analyst. I love mm -hmm. to dabble in semiconductor and, you know, where I stand on ARM and Intel. But at any rate, um, one of the analysts was saying to me, there's an interesting dynamic going on. And you, you may be all over this. Well, of course, we've read about how there's a rift between a AWS and NVIDIA. NVIDIA wants to put its full system into a the AWS cloud and you know sell it as a service. AWS won't let him them. So one of the analysts said, and so the result is NVIDIA is somewhat squeezing Amazon on GPU allocation. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but this is the information that they, they were sharing. And it's it's I'm curious, is, is do you know anything about that? This could this actually could benefit some of the on-prem companies because a lot of talk about hey, a lot of this work is going to be done on prem. <clears throat> and what do these yeah. things cost? What's a what's a H one hundred cost? Eight grand a pop? Right? I, you know, I don't know, but there's been a report there's billions of dollars being burned by open AI. In fact, there was a report we had on Silicon Angle that open AI could is, is looking to develop their own custom AI chips. Now, even if they Start that going now. Yeah, it's good luck. Some, it's good. It's, it's, go. See you. See you in ten years. <laughs> right. Amazon has. They've been. They've been with Annapurna and all their chip investments. They are locked and loaded. They got the new CMO as former Intel uh, executive um, um, Regine Skillerin, former Cube alumni um, Matt Garman's no no stranger to compute and infrastructure at scale. Um, Selesky gets the game. You know they have a management team. Um, and you got, of course, Dave Brown, right? So you got, I mean, look at, and, and you got my land. They have, they have people that know what they're doing, right? So I think Amazon is well positioned for the chip game on the IS side because that's infrastructure as a service. That's their wheelhouse. I, well, I think, well, I think, I don't, started, I don't think Amazon's going to be in trouble now. But AWS they might get started in, in the short in, term, but they, they can write they it start, out. They started partnering with Annapurna in like, I mean, 2000, gosh. 15? I want to okay. say maybe before that. I mean, Dave, the, they, they, Amazon can ride it out. I mean, look, let's face Let's just say NVIDIA does squeeze it. By the way, they probably are. You know, Broadcom and NVIDIA and these chip guys, they got everyone by by you know by the you know what's because they're controlling the supply. And this is the this is the negotiation that they do as suppliers. So um it's all you know fair and love and war, as they say. So, you know, I think Amazon has to have a strategy and and show the card that they're going to do their own chips just like open ai they, they open AI has to say that they have to go down and spend money to build chips as an alternative that's like the u.s with our energy policy if we don't have energy then we're going to be relying on oil and then we're going to be literally over the barrel pun intended so you know this is the the the, the tech version of that because when you have a supply chain and you get you know hosed by it either on the demand side it's crazy the numbers it just it can be tossed to the side in, in a second. So Amazon is the money and the deep pockets to handle it uh, on the IS side. I, I don't see that being a problem. I think NVIDIA is playing a dangerous game, um, but if they go with their cloud, and I, I remember I pointed that out on the pod a few times ago, like, you know, that NVIDIA announcement didn't, didn't, didn't it had Azure in it, but not Amazon. Hmm, interesting. But well, anyway. the thing is that, that NVIDIA with NUMA and its architecture, and it's software that it developed to allow people to more easily take advantage of, you know, the unique characteristics of GPUs. I mean, they've got years and years and years of a head start on everybody else. There's, there's a lot of talk about all these other, you know, chip startups and Intel, you know, Intel oh, with but, its innovation day, which was very underwhelming. Um, yeah. and now, now the best, the, the, the truth is that you don't necessarily need these giant GPUs to run you know, inference at the edge, but I, but, but I, you know, where I stand, what's going to dominate inference at the edge is arm, low cost arm processors. And that's eventually going to create economics that trickle back into the enterprise and, and guys like Apple and Tesla and, and, and AWS are miles ahead of the market on this stuff. And the, you know, no compression algorithm for experiences. Andy yeah. Jesse loves to say. That's totally true. All right. Let's get into our rant section. As we kind of wind down, we hit all the news. Um, my rants around this flex port thing. Cause I got my attention because Teresa Carlson works there and 
Uh, I've been following the founder on Twitter and sometimes an entrepreneur is young, young, young generation, kind of a class and a half behind us. Um, very wealthy, um, smart guy, but the founder, and he brings in um, Flexport, brings in, um, they're, in the, they're in the logistics supply chain and platform business software, you know, for, for you know, big cargo and stuff, you know, moving stuff across the country, I mean, the world, you know, in, in cargo and stuff. So they hire this guy, Amazon Bezos' lieutenant, Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon founder, uh, David Clark, to come in. He ran logistics for Amazon. <laughs> dot com which is like the whole thing guy knows what he's doing obviously yeah yeah yeah, yeah. exactly yeah he's been there done that um master of that and then of course he comes in and and the place is a mess apparently they want to go public market's great zero interest rate he hires a bunch of people from amazon which obviously they go with him um, and then he and recently hired Teresa Carlson as president and chief revenue officer to get the revenue up. So the guy's essentially got a board, they have a board meetings, um, and he's running, he's got ball control as CEO. And the founder is executive chairman. And he just one day just fired his ass, Ryan Peterson. And this is a classic case of, you know, cautionary tale of, you know, if you're going to join a founder, be careful because founderitis, as you know, we and I talk about because we have founderitis um, as founders uh, in a good way, I think. But you know, founders are fickle and you got to have trust. So what happened here was the guy basically tried to run this company the way he wanted to run it to make it better. The founder didn't like it. There was a little, probably some backroom politics from what I heard went on. He didn't like um, some people on the Amazon team. And then, you know, there was a back and forth and then they had a secret board meeting and they came in and fired him basically. And then they tried to walk that back. And, and then that it's a little kind of a mini smear campaign happened by um, the founder. And then obviously the Amazon guy, Clark, he fights back. Now he's not quoted, but the whole journal article, I mean, CNBC had an article, big in-depth story called insight on CNBC. It's inside story of Dave Clark's last days. I mean, that basically was, they got access to internal documents that was probably set up by the, the people there. Um, it doesn't make the founder look good. Okay. Because the founder came in and said, I'm going to put the company back to profitability. Okay. They had an operator, an Epic operator all time. who didn't work out. And then this guy's like from Amazon's like, I learned my lesson, basically calling him somewhat no integrity kind of saying that. So it, this is the back and forth, but this is like when founders and, you know, they try to bring in operators, it's the dynamic. This is the relationship with, with between good and bad companies. And like founders are tough people. They love their baby and you can't really get them out of the kitchen. The partnership between an operator and the founders have to be there. Respect has to be there. And founders have to understand when you bring an operator in, you got to give them full ball control. And, you know, you always talk about Frank Slootman. You know, Frank Slootman is an operator. He likes to put the founders, stay in your lane kind of thing. And some founders like to be more engaged and some operators like to bring the founder in for leadership. So the roles of the rules of engagement and roles have to be clearly defined in these in companies to be successful. If you don't get the founder operator uh, relationship right, it doesn't go well. And I've seen so many examples of it failing and, and examples where it works. Another example where it worked well was Larry and Sergey um, brought in Eric Schmidt. And they had a three-way there. So that worked extremely well. Schmidt kind of ran the table, ran all the trains, made them all run on time. Larry and Sergey set the agenda on technology and they just print, sat back and watched the money be printed every day. So you, know, you got to let the operator operate and you got to let the founder founder, you know, and do their thing. So that's, that's the cautionary tale. That's my rant for the week. I guess the rant part of it is that it's never really by design, but founders, you have, if you have founderitis, you got to admit it. You got to know it. You got to know that it could be good and bad. Um, and you got And if you bring someone in to run the company, you got to let them run it. So uh, that's I, my rant. I read an article where, and you know more about this than I do, where Ryan Peterson was given a speech at a logistics conference and Dave Clark showed up and sat right in the front row. Mm -hmm. Like just, you know, with the, yeah yeah the no, the, no after he got fired after he got fired yeah after he got fired and then ryan yeah. peterson to your point walked it back and said hey i can't thank dave clark enough for helping with the acquisition and da, 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 and da, 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 which was wow yeah. okay. well I, I, mean, know, I know i know i know a lot about that so here's the bottom line basically he rushed to judgment and then he was over a legal barrel and he had to walk it back for legal reasons clark had a case he basically got trashed he left his 
zillion dollar job at Amazon. Who knows? He could have been CEO. Jazzy could still be running AWS. You don't know. He could have left that job on the table. You don't know. He was Bezos' right hand on the, on the logistics side. So he was a, and so he left that to go run this company. I mean, think about that. I mean, talk about a step wow. down. I mean, you know, That's as Jeff right. Bezos, as Jeff Bezos would say, why go back to fourth grade? So here's the guy goes back to fourth grade to run a startup that apparently, according to David Clark and the the CNBC story, was a shit show. You know, it was classic startup that grew to a point where it just needed to get retooled, put in process, put in operations. And that's just essentially a wholesale changeover operationally, not business wise. So you combine that with the zero interest rates gets turned off. Shipping doesn't happen as much. You got a recession. Then it's like, uh oh, we built up for growth. And, you know, let's just let's just say that, you know, to, to take the founder side, I'm sure David Clark was frugal from an Amazon standard, but you know, probably was used to spending some serious bank to get shit done. So maybe he did spend a little bit, but you know what? That's not really the issue here. <laughs> so, he so found, founderitis or what? Is that no, no, no the, the issue is the guy was spending some cash to get shit done. He had to essentially clean up the operations because it was a good business. And then the market turned and they're over their skis. And then the, the founder came in and then it was, and apparently there was some number reporting issues around the uh, sales forecasting. And they were optimistic under the founder's watch, apparently. And he was trying to clean it up. So it was kind of just, it's just, it's like an organ transplant. It either takes or it doesn't. In this case, the David Clark coming in to take over Flexport just wasn't a fit. It got rejected by the founder and ultimately the culture. And that's just the way it is. You know, and say uh, bring in bring in new new person in is like an organ transplant for a big company, and that's that's the cautionary tale here. That's my my rant is this damage to people's reputations because of this, but it, you know it is it is what it is. It's a cautionary tale. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't know much about Flexport before this, but it does sound like a shit show. So what happens now? I, I I'm googling some stuff. The layoffs coming and. They just dial back and they just start. Lay, they're laying off and yeah i mean they're, they're the founder is apparently really smart experienced um i don't know him personally I've been following his tweets he seems very cool to me um i don't get any bad vibes from him but you know how founders can be behind closed doors dave i mean you know it, when you have a uh, founders are very valuable and if they're not managed properly as you know we're founders they're 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 a double-edged sword they're either propellant or they could be dangerous and i think silicon valley is well documented with the old, the old playbook of you know bringing a bring in someone and bounce the founder out, which by the way, this past generation of startups, that didn't happen. The founders got smart and they put into the bylaws two different stock tiers. Zuckerberg's a great example of that. He made sure he never would ever get bounced. Um, so I think we're in a new generation now where it's kind of old school to have that mentality. I think the new school is much more agile. Transparency is much more of commonplace. And founders are a part of day one and continuing, unless there's some sort of like, you know, personal thing that happens or or some weird event. But for the most part, it's not normal culture to bounce a founder out. So um, I think you got enough VCs now that that have been there, done that, versus the old era of venture capital where most of the guys never even started a company. Now you have a, pretty much 80% of the VCs that are great have done it and they get it. They have empathy. They understand the the pressure, the loneliness, the mental anguish, the ups and downs, and the journey. And, you know, Paul Graham was on Twitter the other day. He said, hey, if you do a startup, it's 10 years of your life pretty much out the window. You know, don't, don't have any expectations of doing anything else. And that's what he actually wrote. And, you know, some place, so you could have work-life balance. They're like, no fucking way you can't. If you're a startup founder, you're, you're all in. The journey is the passion and the passion is the life. There's no work-life balance. It is life. That's what I, I'm saying. And you know, you, and you hear all the successful people out there. That's what they come to grips with That is that their success is because they've gone from being guilty but not having a work-life balance to my work is my life. And that's okay because I love what I do and it's passionate about it and, and it becomes my life. And I think that's a cultural shift that I've seen um, happening from the whole work-life balance movement. I mean, I'm for work-life balance, whatever that means. What, I mean, what does that even mean, Dave? I mean, like, I mean, honestly, really, what does work-life balance mean? Go to you, go to the beach. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm listening to and reading. That's the way I like to do when I listen to books on tape. I, I, I listen in them, but I also get the hard copy so I can go back because it's hard to go back and forth on, on, on audio. And get to the right place and i like to highlight stuff anyway i'm um listening to the um 
the the Elon Musk book, um, and and it's it's amazing. Speaking of work life balance, I mean, I feel like you know we you know we run our company, <laughs> and I feel like and I feel like we work pretty hard. But man, oh man, the the, the people at Tesla and SpaceX, <laughs> it's insane. There is no work life balance. Walter Isaacson, so good. Cube alum. Remember, Stu got him yeah. on it. Uh, Dell Tech World one year. And oh, by the way, I, you know, the SEC is going after him. You mentioned that yeah. in the news. Yeah. So there's something in the book. And I think he tweeted this. He says, Elon tweeted, and I think he tweeted it, but he said, it said SEC stands for SEC. The E in, in the middle is Elon's. And I'm listening to Becky Quick this morning on CNBC. She goes, I don't get it. Like S Elon C. I'm like, and they're like, you don't get it. They're like yeah. we can't even tell you off the air. <laughs> exactly. Like, Whoa, it uh, rhymes with puck. <laughs> no, Dave, with Brendan, puck. Brendan, Brendan just sent me a text. Brendan, our producer. Work life balance means getting more golf incorporated in the schedule. Absolutely right, Brendan. The key, the key, the key is to make golf part of the biz dev. Hey, get the clients uh, that like the golf. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Speaking of golf, I'll be at the SAS Championship next week, Dave. They're uh, SAS as a big Carolina company. They're having the SAS championship. I'm going to be playing in the Pro-Am. I got invited by uh, Brian, the CTO, and uh, I'll be down there. Actually, Brendan and I are going to be heading down, and we're going to we're bringing our cameras. We're going to have a good time. We're going to be inside the ropes. Um, it's part of the senior tour, or they call the championship tour now, and and uh, we're going to do our podcasts from there. So um, definitely, um, we're going to definitely head it down the middle of the fairway there, Dave. Gonna have it on the keep it in the short grass, as they say. Um, I got a 15 handicap. You better get you better go practice, bro. If you're gonna play in a pro am. I better I haven't had time. It's busy. I mean, I got I wanted to do three extra interviews this week and I couldn't get them done. I think I, we did what a bunch of interviews like over 10. Um, yeah, just golf takes up a lot of time. <laughs> so, like Brendan said, you gotta incorporate it to the work. So here's this here's our here's our strategy. If we can get the podcast done, that's at least four holes in. That's an hour. You could probably get how many holes in, you know, six holes and get our podcast done on the course. Oh. Okay. I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, yeah. I don't, not, unlike you guys in the West Coast, I don't have time to golf. Okay. <laughs> and now it's hard so. to it's hard to golf in the snow. <laughs> the weather sucks in Boston. It's, I don't know I how you I, live there. I tell you, John, the the weather this week has been so amazing. Like we the shittiest summer, not the like talk about the mundane weather but it's that time of year and the leaves are changing i had to drive down to new york yesterday because i drive down to new york because it's like you know you and i we can talk yeah. on the phone and it's like four phone calls yeah. down eight phone calls back because yeah. the traffic always sucks but the 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 ride down it was like 75 80 degrees got warmer as you went south the trees we're beautiful. I mean, it's just amazing. And of course, it's probably going to rain tomorrow. And rain. Well, I'm sure everyone just said, fuck work. I'm out of here because everyone, everyone I, I was there for, I spent some time the past month there, as you know, I was down there visiting you and my sister and whatnot. Everyone I talked to was bitching and moaning about how sucky the, the rain was this summer. So I gotta imagine that people just took the week off and just kind of like, got oh, out. check it out. So I stopped on the way back yesterday. The traffic kind of blew. So I said, I'm going to stop at Ryan's Deli. You know, Ryan's. Of course. In uh, Vernon, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. It's like yeah. sort of close to the mass, the Connecticut mass border on 84, for those of you who don't know. It's a great deli. It is the best deli outside of what you can get in New York City that I've ever been to. So I stopped in. It was like quarter of five. There's a, there's a couple of people there, but but I usually sit at the counter and the counter was closed. They're like, close, 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 close. I'm like, what's going on? So I went to the back bar, which I didn't even really know exists because I'm usually there with my family. And I sit down and I'm like, well, what's going on? How come the counter's closed? They said, oh, blue flu. I go, what do you mean? They go, look at the weather. <laughs> Everybody called in sick. <laughs> well, the, well, uh, the uh, the it's fall, and I uh, speaking of weather, it's going to get colder. And the I'm wearing my Bruins jersey today in spirit of the season starting on on, on Monday. So well, let's get it going, Boston Bruins. Let's see it. Yeah, yeah Tuesday, Tuesday's open. Mm -hmm. Tuesday's opening day, October tenth. Uh, for the NHL, Where's NHL my start, chat? and oh, there, it uh, there it is. Well, we we got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, um, as we wind down the pod, I just want to say, if you if you like the pod, give us and drop us a DM. Tell everyone, share it, spread it around. Word of mouth's up, traffic's up. Got a couple more downloads. The downloads are up until the right, Dave. And so 30, 32 straight weeks, 
of the podcast. I'll be podcasting from the golf course at, with the SAS Championship. Uh, shout out to the SAS team out there. It looks like they're going to go public. SAS is, is the uh, awesome software company that's been private for so many years. Um, they're going to break it out. They're well positioned with AI. So I'm going to meet the, the management team down there. And there's some AI policy conversations I'm going to be involved in. But um, SiliconAngle.com, check it out. And by the way, if you have a list of podcasts, one of the things I'm starting to do, Dave, I'm getting back to my old podcast roots. For the people who know me, I've been involved in podcasting 20 years ago. The 20th anniversary is going to be coming around next year. I'm going to start putting together a podcast list of the best enterprise tech podcasts. So if you have one that you like besides this one, like the Cloudcast, Brian Gracely's podcast is very awesome. Um, send it to Great. us. If you have any other podcasts you think that are kind of related around leadership, tech leadership, um, uh, Trent Griffin just shared one today that I've never heard, I haven't heard before um, about stories about uh, a Microsoft executive who worked with Jobs, Gates, and um, all the top people. Um, and also, um, what's his name, who uh, bought the Seahawks? Um, who is who is the other Microsoft founder? Uh, what's his Ooh, name? Uh, Bomber? No. Um, the the, guy who, the uh, no, uh, Paul Ryan. Uh, Paul, Paul, Paul Allen. Paul no, Allen. Paul Allen. Paul Allen. Yeah, Paul Allen. Okay. Of course I knew him. He's the guy, Paul Allen's, the big story with Paul Allen is, is that he, if you remember, he's the one that convinced Bill Gates to drop out of Harvard. He's the one that yeah, showed Gates right. the popular science article that gave them the idea to start coding and building an operating system. I mean, that's how they, that's how they ideated back then. They would read popular science. Now it's like blogs and a podcast. So if you got a podcast out that they like, let me know, let us know, DM us, share it on Twitter. We want to grab it. We're going to start a little podcast role like a blog role of the, our favorite podcasts um, because I just find it very helpful to share that David because you know I'm always looking for a good podcast especially once not, not, not all of them are good out there some of them um, kind of are long in the tooth some don't really are shallow hot takes or they're kind of pay payola podcasts um, getting paid by by the vendors so if you see a good podcast let us know and we'll put it up here all right, that's episode 32. Dave, thanks for uh, taking the time. Have a great weekend. We'll see you in a yeah, couple John. weeks. Yeah, next week I got UiPath forward six. Sixth year of forward UiPath forward. It's always a fun event, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. And then two weeks, SuperCloud. Two, All right. three weeks. Yeah. All right, we'll see you there. See you in the next pod. Thanks, everybody.